tools greater than new masters is not e equal to new futures. And uh, I stole it from uh, a production I'm working on right now with some young people in, uh, in uh, Manchester at Contact Theater. Um, how many people saw the uh, show yesterday? Hill Brofication? All right, cool. So I got a little message from the future yesterday while I was watching it. Um, someone from, uh, she's from Durban. And she said, so during uh, Hill Brofication yesterday, um, got this message, um, yeah, from the future. You might also call her the oracle. She, she told me actually the kids aren't all right. Especially those second and third generation new Europeans. They're tired of being forgotten. While some shows get accolades for misusing South African kids, for example, traditions and stereotypes. She also said, and I quote, I saw the show in Joburg, my ears hurt, and I was bothered. Yeah. I won't name her name either. Um, but so, um, I digress. I'm supposed to be here to talk about uh, urban dram dramaturgy. Um, so I'll give you a little, uh, what I'll do is I'll give you a little kind of theoretical sort of uh, background in terms of like the work that we do and what we use to, as a basis for the work that we do. Um, and then I'll end after. So intersectionality. Um, how many people are familiar with intersectionality as a term? All right, that's good. This is already a start. Um, so intersectionality was um, is a term that is currently being um, bantered around more and more. Um, definitely in the last, uh, definitely since 2016, um, and. Um, especially in the cultural sector. So Kimberly Crenshaw, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, she's a professor of law and um, um, critical race theory at UCLA and Columbia University. She came up with this term um, uh, in, in the 80s while she was working on a case. Intersectionality has always been a thing. You know, um, you had people um, like uh, Claudia Jones, you had people like um, 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 Paul Robeson, uh, Audre Lorde, who embodied James Baldwin, who embodied intersectionality, but Kimberly Cren Cren Crenshaw in the late 80s coined the term. Um, and so um, these three women, um, I've shown this before and, um, for those who are at IETM, so um, this is like the time to prove your, that you were paying attention. Where are you? Uh, oh, there you are. Okay, yeah. Oh, so who are these women? I don't know. Oh. Okay. Yeah, no, I understand. You have a busy life. Um, so these three women um, are, have been really crucial the last few years, definitely since uh, 2012 or so. Um, um, the, these three uh, women are um, the founders. Well, they don't call themselves the founders, but they're the ones that initiated, in a way, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, Alicia Gaza, Opal Tometi, and Patrice Coolers. Um, very interesting. If you all get a chance, um, uh, check out their website and the platform uh, statement because one of the things that they do is you know they work around this idea of um, diffuse leadership models. You know, um, and um, so I think it's really interesting, especially for our, our cultural sector. But one of the things how they I, I use them today just because they also are kind of, you know, very much steeped in the idea of intersectionality. And this is something that they say. Um, I don't know what happened there, but that's okay. Um, we believe in elevating the experiences and leadership of the most marginalized black people, including but not limited to those who are women, queer, trans, femme, gender non-conforming, conforming, Muslim, formerly and currently incarcerated, cash poor and working class, disabled, undocumented, and immigrants. In recent years, we have taken to the streets, launched massive campaigns, and impacted elections, but our elected leaders have failed to address the legitimate demands of our movement. 
We recognize that not all of our collective needs and visions can be translated into policy. But we understand that policy change is one of many tactics necessary to move us towards the world we envision. We can no longer wait. Um, so this, to me, is one of the, I mean, there's many other individuals uh, um, who say it differently, but this embodies intersectionality, especially intersectionality as we live in 2019 and moving forward um, with problematic individuals in the U.S., problematic politicians in uh, France, problematic uh, politicians in Hungary, problematic politicians in Belgium. It's really crucial to remember the work that's being done in a lot of communities. This is a U.S. example, but there's also Black Lives Matter in Denmark, there's also Black Lives Matter in London, um, and there's also, of course, besides Black Lives Matter, there's other initiatives that we need to kind of keep in mind and try to find ways to ally with and not be scared off by the Black Lives Matter. Um, there's a reason for that, by the way. So, like I said, we use a lot, we use these theoretical um, uh, starting points as a way to uh, inform the work that we do, or at least I do. I, I can speak for my other colleagues, but I won't. I'll just be in the, in the eye within um, the work that I do at the KBS, um the Royal Flemish, or the City Theater of Brussels. So um, in 2016, using this concept of intersectionality, um, I asked uh, Sabrina Mafus, um, uh to be one of the first artists to um, lead um, this idea that I uh, came up with together with Michael de Koch, the artistic director of um, the KBS, um, and it's called Slow, Slime on Worlds. Michael was like, hey, Tunde, can you help create something using slime, the slime poetry um, and work into a theater? So Slow was the result of that, Slime on Worlds. Um, so what happens is, for example, an artist like Sabrina Mafus, who is Egyptian, Guyanese, um, and British, based in London, um, invite her to do a three-week residency um, in Brussels, and end up that three weeks meeting with local actors, local players, um, like a d diverse array of individuals. You know, so it's not just um, like going into a city um, and picking. Uh, artists and transforming, transporting them to uh, a place like Dresden. That doesn't. That that's not. That's not the participatory uh, ideas that we need these days. Sorry to say. Um, so anyway, Sabrina Mafus came um, and she worked on the first slow in 2016. And with each slow, we asked. We asked. We're now on the fifth slow coming up in um, 2020. And with each slow, we asked the question. We asked a different question, and the question that we asked in this one was, um, in the context of Brussels, um, what is Muslim feminism? As you, you all might remember, uh, 2015 was the bombings uh, that took place in Brussels, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, Am I, is, is it, thank you. March 2016, of course. Yes, yeah, of course. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, so in March, so uh, what I was going to say is that very pertinent question, what is Muslim feminism? Um, in, 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 in that time, and still I think till today, a very urgent question that we need to continue to ask ourselves. Um, so the intersectionality, what is the intersection in that, intersectionality in that question? for those who understand intersectionality. We don't have, I only have 45 minutes, so. <laughs> don't be shy. I saw like a few hands, like, now all of you are gonna be shy with like, raise your hands earlier, I mean later. Well, I think it's um, looking at um, feminism and at um, a Muslim, uh, the combination of Muslim and feminism. Okay, and yeah. Feminism. Yeah, so the intersectionality would be um, so what intersectionality does is it looks at individuals, it looks at groups of individuals. So you're almost right. Um, um, I still won't say your name. Um, uh, uh, 
Uh, but what it does is that it looks at individuals and groups of individuals. So the question is, what is Muslim feminism? So the intersectionality in that question is, um, what are we looking at? We're looking at gender. We're looking, in this case, uh, mostly at ethnicity. Um, and we're also looking at the, in, in the, at the intersection of religion. So you have, I don't have three hands. Alice, if you could help, I mean, it's not really necessary. So you have these different intersections. So you have ethnicity, gender, and religion. Um, thank you very much, Alice. Um, I didn't know that was going to happen, but that's why you get paid the big bucks. <laughs> um, um, so, so religion, of course, in um, progressive Western Europe is often something that we like to um, act as if it is no longer a thing, you know, um, but it is very much a thing, not only because of uh, Muslims living in, um, in Western Europe, but just because of the fact that its shapes are very, well, your very institutions, I can't claim Western Europe, I still have to claim the U.S., um, and that, um, yeah, so it still very much shapes our institutions, our holidays, and our practices, although we like to act as if it doesn't. Abortion, anyone? You know? Um, so, um, so yeah, anyways, I digress. I digress a lot, just so you know. Um, so so um, part of uh, this project, uh, the, this first slow, um, is, was also kind of going out as a, as a city dormitory and um, in, in, interacting with individuals like this, interviewing individuals like this, um, with hijabs, without hijabs, Muslims, non-Muslims, and asking this question. Um, the, the website actually, we created a website collecting the interviews called what is Muslim feminism.com on Tumblr, but I, last I heard something was happening with Tumblr, so I don't know if you can still find it. Um, so, you know, it was really, it's really important to make sure that the, the, the power dynamics really kind of shifts, that it's not me as a city drummer, as part of the, art, as part of the artistic team of the KBS determining uh, kind of the layout of the whole project. That is Sabrina Mahfouz, along with the individuals um, that she meets along the way that determines the outcome of the project, right? Um, and um, another uh, kind of uh, way that intersectionality seeped into our program was in um, October of 2017 with Beyond the Binary when we asked uh, the Warrior Poets, a uh, uh, Brussels-based uh, queer organization, a lesbian organization um, uh, inspired by Audre Lorde um, to uh, curate a night um, looking at the um, um, intersection of uh, queer identity, ethnicity, um, uh, gender, and um, also class. So those different four uh, intersections. And so the Warrior Poets, um, a collective of two women, invited um, um, uh, individuals, a uh, Somalian poet based in um, Amsterdam, um, a, a femme uh, a dancer, performer from Afghanistan based in, um, in Amsterdam also, and uh, Sorry You Feel Uncomfortable, a collective in London who pretty much took over the KBS box space. It really shifted the way, uh, not only how uh, the, this night was uh, presented by the communication team in the KBS, but it also, I remember my colleague from the technician um, team saying, you know, I've never worked like this before, but I'm really glad, I'm really amazed at the, the, the outcome, and I'm really glad that we got to kind of do this type of pro project in the KBS. So participatory is not just, like I said, once again, about bringing individuals in and showing you know, uh, their traditional dances, um, but it's really about you know, how does it kind of shape the, 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 the working structure also of the institution. You know, from the technician flutes to the communication to the artistic team, all right? 
And so uh, I'm very proud to present to you slow number five. Um, my two other colleagues took over slow number three, which was in Kinshasa with Kinshasa artists um, and Brussels-based artists, and slow number four, which was a Mexican-based artist, Rojo Cordoba. And now uh, I'm going back to my roots, so I'm doing slow number five. And um, slow number five is going to be with uh, the Beirut-based uh, Haven for Artists. Um, I'm really excited about it. Uh, hopefully it's a good product, uh, but just the fact that we're able to do this is really exciting. So they're going to, I'm going to be going there uh, in October and they're coming in uh, 2020 um, um, and we're going to be focusing on the idea of uh, queerness and um, the understanding of courage and power um, with this queer. I'm uh, sorry, with this slow number five. So those are some of the ways that intersectionality um, is being used within um, the Cabellas context within the work that I do at the Cabellas. So the next theory uh, that I would like to kind of uh, frame for you all is um, the understanding of uh, decolonization, anti-colonization, and post-colonization. Anyone familiar with this, these terms? <laughs> Look at you like, I don't know. I don't know if I should be raising my hands. <laughs> Why are you shaking your head? Why are you shaking your head? Yeah, it's because I've heard of that. You've heard of that. OK. All right. Yeah. Um, so um, you know, the thing about these terms is, once again, um, like intersectionality, actually even more than intersectionality, these are hot buzzwords these days. You know, um, and dep depending on the circle that you are in, it also determines how you feel about these terms. I was at um, a school, a very important school in Antwerp, that trains uh, uh, actors um, and theater makers. Um, I won't name names because I try to behave sometimes. And um, I was supposed to start teaching in 2019, 2020. So we had a first meeting. And um, besides the fact that I was informed that one of my future colleagues, um, who's a, one of the kind of um, uh, uh, um, gods or kings of uh, uh, critique in, in Flanders. He was there, um, and um, apparently a student has decided, a student of color has decided to no longer go to his class. And, um, and he said, yeah, she doesn't come to my class anymore. And I said, wow, you're very flippant about this reality. You should be worried. Um, and so when I said that, the, the, co uh, the coordinatrice, uh, coordinator, feminist, uh, woman, not feminist, woman coordinator, said, yeah, she doesn't go to the class anymore because he used the N-word. <laughs> right? So, you know, that's problematic, and that's something that we need to take seriously because that, for that student who I later found out is a Moro young Moroccan uh, woman of color, 20-something uh, years old, that for her, hearing this white man in his 60s using the N-word is, is a form of aggression. And is a form that doesn't, it is a, she doesn't feel safe in that space. So we should be worried about that. And then um, later on, the other coordinatory said, yeah, we, in addition to asking you and others to come and teach this class, uh, we would also like to organize a symposium. And, um, but we're not going to call the symposium decolonization because decolonization is an aggressive word. <laughs> Just saying, I'll let y'all, you know, I won't, you know, yeah, exactly. That, I don't know what that means, but I like that. <laughs> um, so, so anyways, this is something that I don't use the term um, all the time, but it's a really important term in terms of the work I do and in terms of kind of how I see myself and where I come from. Um, so, France Fanon um, can kind of be seen as one of the, uh, uh, well, kind of the father of this idea of decolonization. Um, also, the author of Black Skin, White Mask. Um, 
And this is uh, Professor Gloria Mecker. Um, yeah, so you know who that is. Um, so she was, she was the former head of the um, Gender Studies Department in Utrecht, and she also wrote this book. If you have not read it, please do re read it. It's called um, uh, White Innocence. Um, um, Bitte homeschooled in its Netherlands um, for any Dutch speakers. I think there's like two in here. Um, anyways, um, definitely do read it uh, because it looks at the Dutch context in terms of colonization and how the, the colonial project still informs the society today, right? So what she says, um, part of what she says in that book is she says, an unacknowledged reservoir of knowledge I love people who tell that. I, I give classes and I actually, they read these quotes. So if anyone loves to read, just let me know and I won't read it. So, um, um, so you can read it out loud, just let me know. Um, an, un an unacknowledged reservoir of knowledge and effects based on 400 years of Dutch imperial rule plays a vital but unacknowledged part in dominant meaning making process, including the making of the self taking place in Dutch society. So replace Dutch society with German society, replace German society with French society, replace uh, French society with Belgian society, replace uh, Belgian society with Norwegian society. You kind of get the point. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, right? Um, so um, another way, so in, um, with understanding this uh, idea of new meaning making, this so new meaning making process, this project by my, uh, that was started by my colleague Kristen, um, together with, uh, tell my mom I'll call her back later. Um, <laughs> Um, together with um, Sukina Douglas, who is a poet rapper from London. Um, so this uh, Rise Up was started in kind of commemoration a year after the bombings in um, Brussels to start a discussion, not only with the Eurocrats in, um, in uh, 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 Luxembourg plots, uh, but also with uh, the uh, Muslim or non-Muslims living in Molenbeek, or the kids living in Anderlecht, the, uh, the, the kids living in poverty in uh, Kukelberg, wherever. So to start a discussion through slam poetry workshops and then um, uh, have the um, final process shown in the KBS um, cafe. Um, so that's a way of kind of this understanding of new make, meaning making, new meaning making bringing different people, different communities, different classes together. So it's both decolonial, decolonial, anti-colonial, anti-racist, and also intersectional in its approach, right? So that's my colleague, so it's not just me, just to let you know, I'm not just the crazy one in there um, that's doing these kind of work. Um, um, this is just not really relevant, but I, you know, I wanted to show it, especially because of the space that we are in, the, these castles. I'm like, wow, this is amazing, pretty. Um, but where does that go? That's how I was walking in, what, was Frederick or something? That big gold horse statue. I'm like, wow, only if you could melt that statue. No, don't go crazy and go melt that statue. But only if we could melt that statue and pay for another participatory project or another theater piece. Anyways, um, I didn't tell you to do it. So this is um, this is a statue that was done by two uh, women of color, two um, Afro African women of uh, African descendant women um, in Denmark. It was the first uh, statue of a black woman. I think a black person on um, a square in Denmark, in Copenhagen. Um, um, and uh, it's called Queen Mary of the Sh uh, Sugar Burn, uh, 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 pointing to the colonial past of, um, of uh, Denmark, which um, for so many years they like to deny, just like Germany denied its uh, connection to, uh, yeah, that colonial past. Anyways, uh, in Namibia. Uh, anyways, uh, so yeah, this is Queen Mary of the Fireburn. Um, and so what, what one of the artists says, Laverne uh, Bell, was who we are as a society is largely about who we remember ourselves to be. This project's about challenging Denmark's collective memory. This, this project is about challenging Denmark's um, collective memory and changing it. 
So uh, another way that decolonization as a, a theory is used was in um, this pr uh, production, Malcolm X, which was kind of like the, the sort of um, coming out. <laughs> can't think of a better word. Coming out of the, the new KBS team, uh, together with my colleague um, Kristen, I did this uh, dramaturgy for uh, this piece, um, and it's a piece that was uh, directed uh, and conceived by the South African Belgian um, uh, Junior Huntum Beni, um, and the script was written by Fipi Elazuzi, um, who some of you might know. Um, he wrote the book Dreddy in the Nacht. Um, it's also translated in uh, German, uh, by the way. Anyway, so it involved individuals like Sukina Manira uh, from um, Poetic Pilgrimage, who are two London-based uh, hip-hop hip hijabis, um, um, as, as well as other uh, individuals from um, based in Belgium itself. Um, I would show the trailer, but that's not really necessary. Um, so the last term that I would like to address is uh, exotification. So we saw a perfect example yesterday, as many of you loved it. Um, so it worked perfectly for my speech. Uh, um, so exotification. Um, so what uh, Joachim Ben Yakub, Professor Joachim Ben Yakub, who is a uh, 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 um, um, who is a a what would he be? Algerian? No. Tunisian, sorry. Tunisian Flemish um, professor. Um, um, what he said in relation to um, Muslim festival. Um, is there a question? No? Oh. Yeah, if there's any question, just interrupt me and let me know, please. I'm, I'm not so uh, dictatorial. Um, so he said in his study, Orientalism. 1978, Ibrahim Said warns not to underestimate the consequences of a widespread internalization and reproduction of the dominating, dominating West, Western cultural discourses embedded in the camp. Can one thus construct a new consciousness as proposed by the festival, in this case, Muslim festival, or maybe one could also look at the festival, uh, this uh, out whatever festival here. Um, um, uh, so, as proposed by the festival, by referring time and again to a normative body of work and normative concepts without reproducing the entrenched historical power relations. So, some of you might be wondering, or maybe not be wondering, like, why is hilborification a problem? It's a problem to me. I don't know the background. I don't even know the artist, and I wish I had time to talk to the artist. But it's a problem to me because I see inherently a problematic power relation in terms of who gets to decide where the money comes from and who gets to decide what is done with that money, right? Um, so that type of exotification, hopefully, we try to move away from. Um, and um, kind of exploring that was this piece in 2016 also that I did the drama turkey for um, with uh, Sashi Golomaliza, who is an Iranian Flemish uh, actress and theater maker. Um, this piece was called um, Not My Paradise. So really kind of exploring this um, um, uh, extrapolation, no, sorry. Uh, not extrapolation, but mapping, sorry, mapping of um, exotic, exotic realities onto her body and what she is expected to play as an Iranian uh, descendant individual. So she still gets roles as, or she used to, and she says no to them, or tries to get roles as a hijabi wearing terrorist. Um, she was just recently in the Brian De Palmer film that was straight to video, um, where she played actually what she called a smart terrorist. Um, so this understanding of exotification and who, who gets to occupy what role is something that we need to question, especially as practitioners of participatory projects or cultural projects in general. 
Um, so this is the context of the city that we live in, uh, in Brussels. You know, as you see, it's a city with uh, multiple capitalist realities, but also multiple um, ethnic realities, and multiple class realities, multiple religious reality, and so on and so forth. That's myself. Uh, uh, in 2016 with my colleague uh, Kristen Roca and uh, um, Gerardo Salinas. I, some of you will see Invited later. So Kristen did the dramaturgy for Invited. Um, we get around, basically. Um, um, and so it, living in, the, in a context like Brussels, it is not all, no longer okay to have an ensemble, to have a theater company, to have one of the most important theater institutions in Flanders be non-representative. So um, this is the ensemble of the KBS as it stands today, um, with different individuals, you know, um, from uh, different cultural backgrounds, different countries, because it's important that what people see on stage uh, reflects what the people that live in the city need to be reflected on the stage that we are the uh, heritors of. I don't know what the heritors are, is, but what is the Um, control? No, Not control, but that we we manage, we manage, yeah, stages that we manage. You know, so you have Moya Michael, the South African choreographer based in Belgium. You have Mesut Asman, the Turkish um, uh, theater maker based in Belgium. You have Junior Umtumbeni, uh, the South African uh, based in Belgium. Oh, sorry, born in Belgium. Um, and you have Sukina Douglas, uh, the London-based uh, Jamaican um, descendant um, artist who's also one of our, so we call the we call it an open ensemble or the KBS faces. So it's really crucial that in 2019 your ensemble looks like this because having an ensemble like, like this also is, talk, is, is kind of looking at power and who has the power and resources from institution, major institutions to tell the stories that they want to tell it, how they want to tell it. So this is the last part of my speech. Uh, or whatever this was, presentation. Um, this is Bell Hooks, all about love, um, uh, uh, and a lot of other books. Um, so, with that reminder, what Bell Hooks says is, um, the desire to make contact with those bodies deemed other, with no apparent will to dominate, assuages the guilt of the past. <clears throat> even takes the form of a defiant gesture where one denies accountability and historical connection. The desire is not to make the other over in one's image, but to become the other. This is from her um, essay, Eating the Other. Um, so I wanted to, because I was asked to come and talk about urban dramaturgy, and I hope that you have a better understanding of the work that's being done at the KBS. But I also found it really crucial because I kind of knew what my audience would look like. I found it very crucial to ask very, hopefully, critical questions that hopefully make you all kind of question the work that you do and how you do the work and the space and the power that you occupy. Um, so um, with that reminder from Bell Hooks in mind, I would like to move to the next part of my speech. The last two weeks, I have not been able to be excited about the prospects of giving this speech. First of all, com coming to the realization that my co that my co conspirator Pelin Basran Pelin Basran was not going to have enough time to create her video message as she tried to balance work and taking care of her six year old son. Pelin left Istanbul and the path breaking garage festival to find more secure grounds in England, and not to mention love. But one can't help but think about the oppressiveness that was looming when she left the country in 2016, with Erdogan's rising authoritarianism beginning to rear its ugly face. Showing my face in front of yet again a mostly white audience made it hard for me to want to give this speech. Since 2017, 
I have, in one way or another, been disrupting the status quo with, without ever wanting to be that guy. I have been deviating from the royal because I just can't sit comfortably while I watch power being consolidate, consolidated in the hands of all the major cultural institutions like the KBS, the single, Kai Theater, Vorhaut, Concert de Brugge, La Monet, the Munz, these are all Flemish institutions by the way. Royal Ballet of Flanders, and of course, your boy Mil Milo's anti Gents. None of them have even a white woman as an artistic director. So these are what, like eight institutions? None of them have even a white woman as an artistic director, let alone a woman of color. Though Royal Ballet of Flanders does have the magician C.D. Larby Shikawi as its artistic director. The Flemish organization, Engagement for the Arts, takes it one step further. They found, quote, out of 198 boards of art organizations in Flanders, 157 has a male president. That's almost 80% of these presidents' first names, 23 appear at least twice, and not for the same individual. Have you, have you all heard about the, the, the default man principle? No? Okay, Google default man. All right. So out of small and large art organizations, even their boards, somebody found it. So out of small and large art organizations, even their boards are not fully representatives. Representative, by the way, you can find an engagement survey on the online version of Rectiverso um, magazine. I share all of this. I share all of this to quote the words of the great civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of writing articles about the whiteness of the cultural sector. I'm sick and tired of talking about the need for intersectional perspectives. I'm sick and tired of trying to convince people, mostly white crowds, that power needs to be decentralized. The mind needs to be decolonized. I'm sick and tired of sitting with allies and accomplices like Petr van Brabant, Shadi Lejbe, Rachida Lamberbet, Pelin Basra, Angela Olodo, Joe Breedfield, Gija Son, and many others to try and find ways to have power redistributed and reimagined. I'm sick of tired of seeing allies, accomplices, and colleagues like Angela Olodo, who put their all into their cultural institutions, trying to use them to change the social political situation of their communities, only to have them burn out due to, to the toxic nature of the work floor of the institution they work for, which in her case is led by a white man in his 60s, and in many cases are led by white men in their 60s. In other words, I'm sick and tired of individuals like Milo Rao, playing genius when in fact they are just white saviors and missionaries. Papa's got a brand new bag. I'm sick and tired of white men, especially those on the left, progressive and having real power, power playing victim instead of taking heed to the criticism that is being offered and using their power and their proximity to whiteness to change things. Hashtag me too, anybody? I am sick and tired of performances like Hate Radio, Orestes in Mosul, or Cordo in Korea from Alice Ripoli, Hillbrofication, and many others that use black, brown, and the body's pains of others as a template to live out their purported decolonial, anti-capitalist, oppressive dreams, when in fact they are just the devil dressed in a new suit. I am sick and tired of playing the magic Negro, saying yes to continuously pressed, saying yes to speeches like this, 
because I feel like solving the above listed shortcomings need to be continuously pressed and cannot wait. I am not worried about not being invited to someone's next major conference that helps them fill in the diversity and participatory checkbox. I am also not interested in being a troublemaker or interested in the performativity of our disagreements. Instead, my dream is that one, two, or many of you, especially the white men in the room who have real power in the cultural landscape of Europe, stop the discursive fiction and engage in real action that will stop us from just using the images of women in hijab, in hijabs, or black bodies in colorful outfits to sell our participatory wet dreams, and instead give individuals like those real power, resources, and space to create their own projects that they conceive and ex ex execute according to their own guidelines. Even better, I am more interested to see more individuals like Gorky Theater's Sherman Langhoff leading major and small cultural institutions throughout Europe. To drive the point home, I would like to invoke Fannie Lou Hamer herself, and in doing so, show you what good meaning progressive white man in this case, President Lyndon, Lyndon B. Johnson, an ally to Martin Luther King, do to get in the way of progress, especially when it's led by women of color. How much time do I have? <laughs> 10 minutes, perfect, all right. Thank you. So Fannie Lou Hamer, I'll show this uh, real quick. Bear with me, we're almost there. The testimony before the Credentials Committee, the FDP had a lineup of very different people. They had Rita Schwerner, the widow of Mickey, who had been killed in Neshoba County. They had Martin Luther King, everybody knew King. The seating of the delegation from the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party has political and moral significance far beyond the borders of Mississippi of the halls of this convention. But the highlight of the testimony was that of Fannie Lou Hamer, the sharecropper who had been evicted from a plantation had come to symbolize the Mississippi movement. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee, it was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first class citizens. We were met in Indianola by policemen. The president, Andrew Johnson, he's not afraid of Martin Luther King's testimony. He's afraid of Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony. And so he decides that the country should not see her testifying live. Johnson is in the White House, and he convened an impromptu press conference. So we'll return to this scene in Atlantic City, but now we switch to the White House and NBC Robert Dorowski. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. On this day, nine months ago. He did it knowing that they would break away, thinking he might announce who his choice of vice president was going to be. Instead, he gets up there and he announces, get this, he announces that it's nine months to the day since, since Governor Connolly, who was there, was shot along with President Trump. So he announced a nine month anniversary. Everybody's scratching their heads. Thank you, Governor. And then he leaves. And by that time, Fannie Lou Hamer's testimony was over. However, it backfired on Johnson because it became a story that she had been taken off television and in the news that night and for days afterwards, they replayed her testimony. I was carried to the county jail and put in the booking room. They left some of the people in the booking room and began to play something and say it. 
She had Mississippi in her bones. Martin Luther King or the Snake Field Secretaries, uh, they couldn't do what Fannie Lou Hamer did. They couldn't be a sharecropper and express what it meant, right? And that's what Fannie Lou Hamer um, did. At the end of that speech in 1964, she asked as tears welled up in her eyes, all of this is on account we want to become first class citizens. And if the Freedom Par Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave where we have to sleep with our, our, with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as dis decent human beings in America. Sadly, without over-dramatizing, in, in Europe, in a Europe that has foreign ministers sending immigrants from Ghana, Sudan, and even Jamaica back, either to abject poverty or to their debts, we need to ask ourselves, in this Europe, as cultural practitioners, as cultural practitioners, is this the Europe that we envisioned? Are we okay with foreign ministers like this one from Belgium sending, are we okay with foreign ministers like this one from Belgium sending individuals back to countries where they eventually meet their death? I don't mean to be dramatic, but I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I am sick and tired of the semantics. We need radical change. And as cultural practitioners, especially the mostly white men directors of institutions, I implore us all to do some deep soul searching and start really affecting, effecting change, not only by the things we create, Instead of focus, focusing all of our energy creating participatory projects, plays that will allow us to empower an individual, quote unquote, or groups of individuals, we need to spend more energy thinking about and devising ways to give our power away to different disenfranchised and underrepresented groups. We need to find devising ways to give our power away to disenfranchised and underrepresented groups. To end, I would like to quote the, the great Audre Lorde, poet, lesbian poet um, and activist. If we restrict ourselves only to the use of those dominant power games which we have been taught to fear, then we risk defining our work simply as shifting our own roles within the same oppressive power relationships, rather than as seeking to alter and redefine the nature of those relationships. This will result only in the rise of yet another oppressed group, this time with us as overseer. It is our visions which sustain us. They point the way toward a future made possible by our belief in them. There is a world in which we all wish to live. That world is not attained lightly. That world is not attained lightly. If, as black feminists, we do not begin talking, thinking, Feeling ourselves for its shapes, we will condemn ourselves and our children to a repetition of corruption and error.